Let me invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible with you today, uh, grab one of the pew Bibles in front of you and turn to page, I think, 233. 233. 1 Samuel chapter 12. The time of the judges has ended in the nation of Israel. As we said, as we started going through the book of Samuel in our English Bibles, we have 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, but as we begin to go through this book, we talked about how this book helps us see the transition from the judges of Israel to the kings. And God has now given Israel a king, a human king, and he gave it to them because of their wickedness. They had the Lord their God as their king, and he had these judges that would be faithful to to lead his people. They would judge the things of Israel. He would raise up judges, and they would protect Israel. But it was ultimately the Lord who would go before Israel. It was the Lord who would always take them into battle and deliver them as they cried out to him. But they wanted to be like all the nations around them. For those who weren't with us last week, when we were in chapter 11, all of Israel had had somewhat of a ceremony for the new king, Saul. And after that ceremony, they all yelled, Long live the king! But they all went home after that. After Samuel spoke and said, here's here's what the kingdom will look like. Here's what it means to be the king and to be followers of God still. And so he said, everyone go back to your home. And in chapter 11, we saw that Saul went home and one of Israel's old enemies that has always caused them trouble, the Ammonites, came in and they were seeking to come and enslave the nation of Israel. And as they came, to Jabesh Gilead, they said, you need to surrender to us or we're going to wipe you out. And they said, well, we, 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 we want to see, Israel said, that we want to see if maybe someone will come to our aid. So give us a little bit of time before we go, before we surrender to you. Let us see if somebody will come to our aid. Because part of what the king Nahash wanted to do was you can surrender, but I'm going to gouge out your right eye. And bring shame upon the nation of Israel. And they would be slaves and not able to fight. And so the news had reached Saul who had gone home. He was out in the field doing kingly things by working in the field. It was interesting. We talked about that. But when he heard the news, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And he had a a great anger, a righteous anger. And he found a way to get all of Israel to follow him. And they went and they attacked the Ammonites. And God gave them victory. And chapter 11 ended with the people right after the victory. Some of the people go, hey, what, 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 where are some of those people that were saying we, we shouldn't have Saul as king? Where are they? Some of those other Israelites. We need to kill them for saying that. Look what Saul just did. He just delivered us. We need to kill those guys. Saul says, no, 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 no. That's not what we're doing today. We're going to rejoice Because God has given us salvation. God has delivered us. Saul was right on that one. So then Samuel, at the end of chapter 11, said, God has given us salvation. He's delivered us. Let's get everybody back to Gilgal. And let's renew the kingdom. Let's renew our commitment to God as our Lord and King. 
and they made sacrifices and everyone rejoiced greatly. And the story doesn't end there. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 12 today. We'll ask the Lord to help us see what this text means. It doesn't matter what it means to you. It matters what it means. So we'll work through it and see what it means. And then hopefully some ways that it applies to our lives. Follow along silently as I read through the text today. 1 Samuel chapter 12. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. Verse 4, they said, You have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, He is witness. And Samuel said to the people, The Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egypt Egyptians oppressed him, then your fathers cried out to the Lord and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. but they forgot the Lord their God. And he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Verse 10, And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord, and we have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbaal and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side. You lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And now behold, the king whom you have chosen for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But... If you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Verse 17, is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord 
will not forsake his people for his great name's sake because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and right way. Verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. This passage section is known as Samuel's farewell address. He doesn't actually go away, but he's stepping back. He's stepping down from being the judge, the leader in that way over the nation of Israel. It's time now for Saul to lead. He's still going to be there as the, the prophet, like the priest. But now it's time for Saul. So Samuel takes his time and he addresses, and notice in verse 1, he addresses all of Israel. Everyone's there to hear him. And he starts off and he says, I have obeyed all that you wanted, nation of Israel. I've set a king over you. That's what you wanted. And now he talks about his, his lifespan. For those of you who've been with us throughout this study, you know that even from a, a young child, he's been serving under Eli in the temple. He's saying, look, the king now walks before you. I'm old and gray. My sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until now. And then he goes on and he, he kind of puts himself on trial here. He says, testify against me, verse 3, before the Lord and before his anointed. We have the new king. You all testify against me, Samuel says. What have I done? What evil have I committed? What bribes have I taken? Who did I defraud? Who have I oppressed? Verse 4, they say, you haven't done anything. You haven't done any of that evil. And in verse 5, he says, the Lord is witness against you. Why, why does he say that? His anointed is witness this day that you haven't found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. You, you have the Lord your God as your king. He put me, Samuel saying, he put me over you and I've led you and I didn't do anything wrong. And that wasn't good enough for you. And so now you have said with your own mouths that God has been faithful. And now God's witness that you knew that. The king, how, how's, how's Saul feeling right now, huh? <laughs> the new anointed one, oh. Verse seven, he says, now stand and let me tell you a little bit more about your great sin. Let me tell you about the, the righteous deeds of the Lord that he's performed for you and your fathers. And he goes back. We see from the book of Genesis and onward, he goes back and he talks about God's faithfulness. How when Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them and they cried out and so God raises up Moses and Aaron and delivers them. And later, throughout Joshua and the judges, he points out, all these, all, you guys keep going, you keep worshiping these false gods, and God keeps delivering you over and over and over again. He is so merciful to you. He's delivered you. And then when Nahash comes, this, this king of the Ammonites, after God's been so faithful over and over again, he comes and you say, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Then in 13, he says, now behold, we're at that point. The king, look at this, you have, you have both human responsibility and the sovereignty of God working here. Watch this. And now behold, the king whom you've chosen, for whom you've asked, behold, the Lord has set that king over you. It is exactly the person that the Lord will put there and it's also the one that they wanted. The one that's the Hebrew hunk, as we talked about, right? Taller than all the others. Good looking guy. And 
And right here, you, you just think, as I was reading through the text, it's like he's just bringing it. He's just showing them how unfaithful they are. That's bad news, man. And then look what he says. Look at 14, or 13, rather. No, no, 14. I don't know, 13. <laughs> Verse 14, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you, now watch this, and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. He's so gracious. His people completely reject him. Completely reject him over and over and over again. We don't want you as our king. We want this human king. And then he says, it is what it is now. This is where we're at. So, start being faithful today. Start being faithful today. Right now, start following the Lord your God. If you will, Fear the Lord and serve him. Obey his voice. You and the king, it's going to go well. How gracious. He's so gracious. But then there's a warning. Verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. We get a fresh start today. but you better follow. You and your king better follow. This is the king you wanted. You better follow. So then then Samuel says in verse 16, now therefore stand still and see the great thing that the Lord's going to do before your eyes. I'm going to show you how serious the Lord is about this. Is it not wheat harvest today? Don't really have storms in that part of the world during this time of year? They don't really come. He goes, you know what? We don't have really storms. I'm going to call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain and you're going to see your wickedness which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking for yourselves for a king. I'm going to show you how serious God is. And so Samuel in that moment he calls upon the Lord and that very day when these, these storms did not come the Lord sends thunder and rain and the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. You know, the Lord does that. He sends you great storms to show you how serious he is. Whatever those storms look like, he shows you how serious he is. And the people got it. Look at verse 19. They got it. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. Watch this. Listen to what they confess for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. They got it. Oh man, we've really done it. We're in big trouble now. Samuel, will you pray for us? Pray that we will not die. Pray that God will not wipe us out. And look at the graciousness of God. Do you see in verse 20? He's so kind to us. It's that idea, I've heard others talk about it. Like we're, we're like ungodly religion and, and, and a lack of relationship with God is, is, is kind of this idea. I've messed up. Oh man, I sure hope God doesn't find out. But the gospel is, oh man, I've messed up. I need to run to my dad. I need him. And you see God's heart right here. They repent. They're like, oh man, we're doomed. Verse 20, and Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. (laughs) He still tells them about it. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all of your heart. Wherever you are at right now, the sin that you're in, the sin that you need to repent of, whatever the Lord is convicting you of, here's the command. Don't be afraid and don't be like some who do this over and over again. They run from God. They run from the church. They run from the word of God and they get out of here because they messed up and they have that shame we talked about last week. And so they're not here. 
Because they're trying to hide from the Lord. That's not where you go. You go to the Lord. That's what Jesus is all about. That's what this Holy Week is all about. The King coming for us. Don't turn aside. Start where you're at and follow now. Be faithful to Him now. And He says, follow Him with all your heart. And 21, and do not turn aside after the empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. Don't run to something else trying to get fulfillment or protection or anything else. Don't run there. They're empty. And some of you have experienced that. You've gone there. They're empty. They promise a lot. And then they don't deliver because they can't. And here's the verse that holds the whole thing together. This is why this happens. This is why this is true. Watch this. Verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people. Why? For his great name's sake. Because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Church, hear that today. Yes, nation of Israel, but this is for all peoples, all tribes, all tongues, all nations. We're made a kingdom of priests. We're brought in to be part of his family, his people. He does that. Why? For his great namesake. That's why he's glorious. He's great. He gets all the glory. We praise him. It's not because you're awesome. It's because he's awesome. He saves us for his great namesake. Our job Sing to him, praise him, be thankful, and tell everyone about the great name. That's our job. Don't chase after the empty stuff. I know, but I've done some bad things. Don't be afraid. Oh, I've done great evil. Don't be ashamed. Christ took that. Serve the Lord. Start now. And it will not fail. He will not fail. Why? Because he is faithful to himself. God is faithful to himself. Long before any of us ever existed, the Father, Son, and Spirit living perfect harmony. And the Father has this plan that the Son's going to come and save a people for God. The Spirit's going to apply that very thing to our lives. And what do we see? We see creation exist. We see the story of the Scriptures, not just the nation of Israel, but all tribes, tongues, and nations unfold. And Jesus and John says this. Jesus says, all that the Father's given me, all that the Father, all the the people that the Father's given me, they're all going to come to me, and I will not lose even one of them. You think you can trust Jesus? He comes, and this is not a maybe. It's not a maybe that the Lord's going to make a people for himself. That is a guarantee. You want to read about it? Go to the book of Revelation. Multitude of every tribe, tongue, and language. That's his people. And every one of those the Father has given to the Son, and the Son loses none of them. He is faithful. And then Samuel says, Moreover, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. I will instruct you in the good and right way. His ministry is going to continue. He's not going to stop just because they've they've sinned and chosen uh, a human king and replaced him. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop praying for you. I'm not going to stop teaching you. And the same thing's true for us. Just because people have, have sinned around us and hurt us and things, we don't stop. We keep serving. We keep praying for them. We keep encouraging them. We keep instructing. That's what we do. We keep going. But then he reminds us at the end, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. He ends with that. God has promised to make a people for himself. That's the plan. Does God's plans ever fail? Never. He will accomplish his purposes. He does this for his great namesake. And as we even look at Palm Sunday, 
We see, of course, Saul here, who's the human king that's now put into place, and he's not going to be the best guy. As though you read forward like one chapter, he's going to fail. Then you're going to have another guy, David, who does a pretty good job. He's not the answer. He has a son. Wisest guy ever, other than Jesus. Solomon, guess what? Not him. Then you read First and Second Kings, and you know what? Ooh, man, we're getting really bad. Then Palm Sunday hits. A thousand years after this. And this peasant, this lowly guy, as we read earlier, says, hey, go in there. I need a donkey. Not a war horse. I need a donkey to ride in on. I need to humbly come and fulfill prophecy and show that I'm coming in my first coming to Jerusalem as the servant king who comes to die. A thousand years after this. The problem is all these other kings They needed to lead the people and they needed to follow God faithfully. Could they do it? No. Jesus comes. He lives that perfect life that each one of us should have lived and all those kings should have lived. He lives it. And then he he goes through Holy Week, which we'll be studying, and then he suffers and dies in our place and in the, the, the king's places. He dies in our place even though he was perfect. And as we were singing... After three days, he rises, showing that he is the king, the true king, the king of kings, the one who can obey perfectly and be faithful. And guess what, friends? We're still the people who aren't faithful. But you get the credit of faithfulness from Jesus to you. I mean, amen to that, right? He says, y'all can't do it. That was part of the overall plan. We knew that. So here's Jesus' faithfulness. And you give him your sin and you trust in him and you are made as part of his people, people of the king. And as we also were singing, guess what? That king's coming back. He's coming. And so Palm Sunday was, he's entering in as a servant on the donkey. And the people, what were they yelling out as he was coming in? What were they yelling? Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Here he is! It means save us! Salvation's coming today! Hosanna! Hosanna! You know what they're yelling by Friday? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Because he wasn't the king they wanted. They wanted another Saul. They wanted somebody different. He's the King of Kings. And so for us, as we celebrate, as we move into Holy Week, as we get to Resurrection Sunday, that, that Hosanna, which deliver us, turns into a hallelujah for us. Amen? Amen? Seven takeaways from the passage for you. God graciously and mercifully calls us to start following him from where we are currently at right now. That's something for you today. Where are you at? Oh, I've been struggling. I've been struggling here, struggling there. Start today. Start today. Follow him. When you serve him, second one, serve the Lord with all your heart, right? Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And also your neighbor, love him as yourself. We need to understand, and this is covered in John 14, Jesus teaches about this, that to love God is to obey God. We see that here and we see that in John. And what's great is in John 14, when Jesus is teaching about that, he says, if you love me, you're going to obey me, but don't worry, I'm going to give you the helper to help you to do that, the Holy Spirit. The fourth one, again, we cover some of these, but do not turn to the empty things that do not profit or deliver. The fifth one, look at this. Consider all the great things God has done for you and what he's done in his word. If you want to make sure you don't turn to those empty things, here's what you need to do. You need to consider all the great things God has done for you. Focus on that. You know what it'll lead to? A very thankful heart a very thankful heart. You'll just, you'll praise him. you go, I'm not going after that stuff. Look how faithful God's been over and over and over again. The sixth thing to take away is the Lord will not forsake his people. You may feel that way at times. 
God will not forsake you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And the last one is, you belong to the true king. He has made you a people for himself. So let's live like it. Amen? Father, we thank you for this time and thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we're thankful that you are the true king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And you've not left us to ourselves, but you have made us a a people for you, for your own delight. So Lord, as as we think about Palm Sunday and Jesus coming as a servant, help us to have the posture of servants to all servants to one another here, servants to the lost, Lord, that we'd be people who would go and talk about your great name, talk about it with one another, and talk about it with those who've never heard about it before. And help us rejoice that our great servant king would die for us with Friday coming, and that he would rise for us with Sunday coming. Lord, help us to think on these things in Jesus' name. Amen.